optimized. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Welcome to another episode of Equity Mates, a podcast that follows our journey of investing. Whether you're an absolute beginner or approaching Warren Buffett status, our aim is to help break down your barriers to investing from beginning to dividend. My name is Bryce, and as always, I'm joined by my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going? I'm very good, Bryce. Excited for this interview. Uh, We've got someone in the studio with us who... If people consume financial media, watch financial news, I'm pretty confident they will have heard his voice before. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, we have reached out to our community uh, to get some involvement uh, for this episode. So we will be asking plenty of questions from the Equity Mates community. But it's our pleasure to welcome Scott Phillips to the studio. Scott, welcome. Beauty. Thank you, guys. Great to be with you. Love the podcast. You guys are doing a fantastic job. So really pleased to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So Scott is the Chief Investment Officer at The Motley Fool Australia and advisor of The Motley Fool Share Advisor and Portfolio portfolio manager of Motley Fool Million Dollar Portfolio and the Motley Fool Everlasting Income Portfolio. Plenty going on there, Scott. Scott has been a member of the Motley Fool since 1998 and an employee for the last 10 years. So we're going to crack into what the Motley Fool is if you haven't heard about it, plus uh, a lot more. But as always, we'll start with our overrated, underrated (laughs) game. Let's do it. Let's do it. So we'll throw a few themes and uh, indexes out there just to get your thoughts on them. Let's do Um, it. We'll start at home. ASX 200, overrated or underrated? If you're an ETF investor, it is underrated. You should be in the ASX 200. It is so desperately dominated by the banks and miners, though. If you've got half an idea and you want to be a little bit more detailed, I think it's overrated. Uh, Moving away then to America, NASDAQ 100, overrated, underrated? Underrated. These guys are the businesses inventing the future. This is going to be a long-term growth story. Now, we couldn't uh, have you on the show without asking this one. Uh, Overrated or underrated Bitcoin? Oh, there we go. (laughs) (laughs) So I have no idea where Bitcoin goes from here, but as an investment, it is massively overrated. If you want to gamble, speculate, punt, then knock yourself out. Fair enough. You've just offended Bryce. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm out. No. (laughs) So for full disclosure, I do have 100 bucks worth of Bitcoin I bought about five years ago just to follow along. It's worth a bit more now, but um, yeah. Jeez, no, give, give it a miss. That. <laughs> exactly. It's been all right. Yeah. Overrated or underrated? Uh, full service brokers. Overrated. The, the incentives are conflicted and the costs are way too high. Um, if you're getting good service and it is genuinely value for money, knock yourself out. But most people are paying more than they need to for brokerage. Mm. Nice one. And then the last one, and we know, so you have a podcast as well, <laughs> and we know this is a topic that uh, elicits rants from uh, you and oh, your co-host. I don't mind a rant. Uh, but we're going we're gonna to ask it here, overrated or underrated, the Australian residential property market? <laughs> as, a, as an owner-occupier, it is underrated. I think if you can get into property, you should, because it's going to be a lifetime lifestyle asset. As an investment, massively overrated. I don't expect it's going to be market beating versus, say, the ASX 200 over the next 10 years. Mm. So, Scott, we always like to start at the beginning with all of our guests, and that is to understand the story of their very first investment. Yes, so, nice. are you able to share yours <laughs> and perhaps a lesson or two that you learned from it? So, here's the it, the story of the, the everyone's first investment generally starts with ignorance, right? And so, that is my story. This is not a story that's going to help anyone invest better other than hopefully to learn from my mistakes. I got a Comsec account, which was originally TD Waterhouse, that's how old I am, back in the late 90s, right? So this is kind of full dot-com boom. This is, for those who were around the time, sausage software, computer share, it's very first iteration, um, all the tech stocks you can think of. So I had a dozen of those probably at different times just because I didn't know what I was doing, but I thought I should be investing. My very first one, though, was I had a, had a boss at the time who told me that all you have to do is you buy shares based on the share price chart, and when it falls, you buy, and when it goes up, you sell. And so that was the idea, right? You just want to look, 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 at the, look at the chart, look at the trend. If it's up, you sell it. When it goes down, you buy it back. When it goes up, you sell it. Of course, that works as long as the stuff that is supposed to go back up does eventually go mm. back up. <laughs> yeah. And when it doesn't, you lose your money. And so that was the that was the story. That was the salutary lesson of my very first investment was a, a, a mining stock. I want to say it might have even been MIM back in the day, the old Mount Isa mining. Knew nothing about the company. The business boss said, hey, you buy that. It's great. It always goes up, then it goes down. You can trade the thing. It's great. Of course, the uh, Sally true lesson is I didn't make any money from it. <laughs> and uh, and I, I learned some expensive lessons. The good news about learning early, of course, is it's normally with less money. So it didn't cost me as much in dollars. But it was a it was a it was a pride hurting lesson, put it yeah. that way. Mm. Yeah. I feel like it's a rite of passage for a lot of Australians <laughs> to have a first investment in a mining company. Yeah, that's probably money. right yeah. too. That's probably right too. <laughs> so you started investing in the late nineties. Yes. Uh, you have been a member uh, an employee of the Motley Fool, I should say, for mm-hmm. the last ten years. Correct. 
Uh, you've had a lot of time in markets. Yes. Uh, over that time, have you developed a personal investing philosophy? Yeah, I. So look, uh, this is not a company plug, but the the reason I joined the Motley Fool as an employee was because I joined the Motley Fool as a member, as you guys said, uh, before the end of the before the turn of the century, and it really was that the lesson was be a long term investor, focus on the business, follow the fundamentals. So I'm not a value guy. But I'm a fundamentals-based investor. And some people, we won't get too technical, but some people kind of confuse those two as being the same thing, right? Value is just buying low price earning stocks or trying to find something that's super cheap is going to go up. Fundamentals is just understanding the business first. So I make, I make the guys at the office talk about companies. I don't let them use ticker codes, for example, which is kind of you know weird and strange and a bit you know um, eccentric. But the reason is because if you start talking about companies as ticker codes, you forget their real businesses. Mm. You start talking about their share price movements or the charts or something else. Better to think about BHP literally as we speak, out there digging iron out of the ground. Woolies are selling groceries right now. Those things are happening. And so being a fundamental-based investor and looking for long-term businesses that are going to have long-term success has been where I've had successes, those types of businesses. And that's what I try and focus on. Mm. I find it ironic that the first company you chose as an example there is both the company name and the ticket card. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Screwed that up, didn't I? Fortescue mining there. Put it that sort of that way. <laughs> so, Scott, as Bryce said uh, yep. in the intro, we've uh, we've reached out to our community to get a bunch of questions. Mm-hmm. And um, look, everyone uh, who's involved in finance will know of The Motley Fool. They yes. probably will have seen you on the news or on the radio, but they will have also seen, you know, the ads. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. Really? We do that stuff? Yeah, I think I think for people who aren't members, Motley Fool is known for ads and emails. Yes. yes. So look, we've got to start there. Um, you know, three hot stocks for 2021. Is this stock the next after pay? Yeah, I've seen those. What, why that marketing strategy? So I, look, I'm not in charge of our marketing team, so it's not my call or, or mine to defend necessarily. A couple of things. The first is it's just successful. Of all of the options we've tried, it's a bit like Winston Churchill said democracy was the worst system of government except for every other one that's been tried, right? We find that both in the US and here in Australia, that strategy just works. Like It just it just works better than anything else we've tried. I've tried writing first-person emails where I say, hey, here's what we do at The Motley Fool. Here's what I've done as an investor. Here's our track record. Please come and join. And we get two members join up. We send out an email like that or an ad like that, and we get tens of members sign up. And so the numbers kind of just lead the strategy, quite honestly. It's not great. I don't love the fact that we have to do that sort of advertising to work. And you can argue about means and ends and we can have that conversation mm-hmm. if you guys want to have that conversation. Um, the, the honest answer is because it works. It, it's it's a story of trying to – my boss says there's, you know, no one wakes up in the morning wanting to buy an investing newsletter or recommend you know, buy, buy an investing service, right? And so what do you do? You get in people's face. You say, hey, I know you're going about your day. Have you thought about this? And that's the best way the marketing team have come up with to do it. I wish it was different. I wish we could honestly just say to people, look, long-term investing works. We have a market beating track record. How about you try us out? The service I run, Share Advisor, has a 30-day money-back guarantee. You literally risk nothing just to come and have a look because you get your money back if you don't like it. And that just doesn't work. And so the challenge for us is where do you draw the line between being as, um, what's the word, clear or as as you know direct as you want to be, which is just investing works. We're doing a pretty good job so far. Come and check us out. And hey, I know you're going about your day. Quick look over here. We've got something you might be interested in. Disrupting that. You're grabbing that attention is kind of what the strategy is about. Mm. Mm. It's tough though because you know you listen to you talk. Uh, your your podcast with Andrew Page, mm. who we've had on the show, is great, and Anir Ban, who you used to host with, is great as well. Yep. We've met. Uh, we follow a bunch of ex Motley Fool people. Okay. Uh, you know Owen Raskovic, yes. yep. uh, Claude great Walker. Guy. You know they're like you guys are all very focused on investor education mm-hmm. and you're very clear thinking, but your advertising strategy it doesn't help investors. And that's the hard part, right? So the our our and I talk about means and ends. Our hope is, for what it's worth, that if we can convince people to, if we can disrupt their day, right, and and change their direction to buy an investment product from us, that we can then help them become better investors. And so, you know, am I saying does does the end justify the means? I guess I am to some degree, and we can absolutely argue about that. The question, I guess, is if we don't do that, are people better or worse if they never join the Motley Fool? Now, if they join someone else's service who also give them great advice and great education, then fantastic. If they don't do any of that and they buy Bitcoin instead, to the comment before, or they start speculating on mining stocks, for example, um, you know, I, yeah, I'm, look, there are going to be people listening who are saying, you know what, I don't care. You guys are doing clickbait ads, you know, go get out of my newsfeed. Okay, cool, I get it. And that's that's a charge they can level at us and they can make their own calls, right? I'm not going to defend that. It's pretty clear that's what we do. Mm. Um I think it's just a case of 
if we can stand behind the services that we deliver once we get people on board, then I feel like we've done an okay job. And if the worst we're doing is saying to people, hey, here's a, you know, a headline that might grab your attention. If that's a bit OTT, if that's a bit clickbaity, then okay, guilty as charged. If we're delivering a terrible result, by the way, and terrible services, I think you people would be absolutely right to say, hey, you guys are ripping us off. You're taking our money. You're giving us out of the wrong path. I would say we've got a lot of members who've been with us for a very long time now who are saying, I don't love your marketing either, but I'm glad I joined. I've got great results. You know, is, is, is again, does, does the end justify the means? Some people, yes. Some people, no. We can't please everybody, and that's just kind of the business that we're in, unfortunately. Mm. Well, now that we've met and we're going to build a relationship, <laughs> oh, dear, here we and go. I are going to take it on here as our go. personal uh, mission to get your marketing team to ditch the clickbait <laughs> and, nice. and lead with education and member testimony. Hey, if, <laughs> hey, if it works, I, you know what? I would, I would be the happiest bloke in the world, quite honestly. Um, as I said, because I've tried to write exactly those emails. Right? Mm. I've tried to literally say to people, here's what we are, here's what we do, here's our track record, here's why we invest, here are some of the returns you can get. And we know people like the emails. They just don't convert to sales. So if you guys look, you know, I'm seriously all ears. If we can find a better solution than that, I'm the first person in the line. I will have, absolutely, I'll chair you guys through the office on my shoulders personally if we can solve that problem. <laughs> so, Scott, uh, there's no doubt that when it comes to paying for newsletters and, and services that um, there's plenty to choose from yep, and it's always heaps. hard to know where does the value come. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a question from one of our audience members, Daniel, is um, around how does The Motley Fool actually differentiate itself from the hundred of, hundreds of paid newsletters that are out there? Oh, that's cool. Okay, so we actually don't... I'm a big believer in not try, not focusing on your competition but focusing on your customers, right? So I would actually say we don't try and differentiate ourselves specifically. We never looked at another newsletter and said, hey, we need to be different from them by doing this or better than them by doing that. What we simply do is provide the best possible investment recommendations, education, and advice we can. And if we do that well, then our customers can choose. Many of our members have got, by the way, multiple subscriptions from multiple companies because they want more ideas, and that's completely cool. Um, most of our competitors are very reasonable, decent people. There are some out there who frankly aren't. And we talk about- Do you want marketing. a name and show? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'd love to spend the next five years in court. Thank you. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. Thanks. There was that day on the Equity Mates podcast where I said, yeah. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize again. Um, so here's the thing, right? You know, there, there is, so there's a marketing angle and there's the there's a performance angle or the results angle. And I am really proud of our investing results. I think- I think every service, as we speak, that's been around for more than a couple of years is beating the market, which is remarkable as a strike rate. Um, our stocks are doing really well. Share Advisor, which I run, is now almost 10 years old and is soundly beating the market over that period of time. So we give the best possible recommendations we can. I've got to say, one of the things I pride myself in and the team does is making sure we deliver great education. Right? People will join us for the recommendations. If we just gave stock tips and nothing else, they'd get what they signed up for. They'd get what we offered. What we're trying to do desperately through the paid service and also things like this podcast and other podcasts and media appearances and stuff is to actually help people become better investors. And for, for me, that's honestly my passion is I want people to beat the market, otherwise they're wasting their money paying for us. And I've said to people, look, if we don't beat the market, cancel and go somewhere else. Don't pay for something you're not getting. You get the market return with an index. Go crap an ETF, go fishing. If you want to try and beat the market, you sign up for someone, they better bloody do the job because if they're not beating the market, then they're wasting your time and your money. So back to your question, sorry. Um, <laughs> how, yeah, how, how are we better or how would we differentiate? That's for someone else to call. I'm not going to. I'm not going to denigrate our competitors. Other than to say, we do the best job we can of beating the market, informing our members, making them better investors. If we do that, then we focus on the customer rather than the competitor. That's what we're trying to do. Mm. Mm. So on on that beating the market point, yep. um, and I, I think this is something that a lot of beginner investors uh, get wrong, thinking that they have to get uh, nail like hit every ball out of the yeah. park and nail every pick. And yep. you know, we were looking at Renaissance Technology recently. Their medallion fund that's turned a hundred dollars into 20 million in 40 uh, in 30 years mm. they bat at 50.75 percent strike rate you got it they just get a little bit more right than they get wrong yep. um but simon from the equity mates community has asked what percentage of motley fools buy recommendations have been correct that's a good question um it differs by service and differs by style right so um i won't this is not for me to, i'm not going to mention products so that i'm not going to try to sell to your audience right i will say the service i run i've mentioned it before but i'm not going to re try and sell it uh, we bat about 60%. We have another service, which is a higher risk service, which bats about 40 to 50%. But the, the winners there are larger than the winners of my service. The losers are also larger, by the way. And so it's a numbers game, right? We know the old line from Peter Lynch in this game, you're good if you're right six times out of 10 is pretty right. Because if you're right more than wrong, and if your average winner gains more than your average loser loses, mm. that's how you do it, right? So mm. to your point, the biggest challenge for new investors is I bought five stocks. One of them's losing money. I'm going to obsess about that one stock. 
And I'll say to people, we've got, so six out of 10 beating the market, I think from memory, seven out of 10 in positive territory, which means I'm losing three out of 10 actual money for mm. members. And we do have some people who join up and say, I bought those two stocks, they're both losing me money, you guys suck. And I'm kind of like, guys, we've said a million times, diversify, have 15 to 20 stocks, be in it for the long term, all that stuff. Part of the challenge with running a newsletter is, is you know, I can give the advice if it's not followed. Mm. Now that's partly my fault, right? I've got to do a better job of helping our members follow our advice, trying to badge them into following our advice. Because if they do it badly, then they lose money. Mm. I look like a deal and no one wins, right? So so yeah, if, if you diversify properly, then the results have been very good. Despite the fact, as I said, six out of 10 beating the market, about seven out of 10, I think, in, for my service, currently in positive territory. Mm. Scott, we've um, always tried to encourage the Equity Mates community to invest in what they know and look for opportunities around them. And uh, one of our community members, Jesse, uh, has taken that, uh, I guess, knowing that you send a lot of emails, he says, what companies does the Motley Fool use to send their emails and are they listed on the ASX? <laughs> that is brilliant. They're not. It's a US company called MailChimp. Yep. Um, so they are, they're very good. We, we like them a lot. Um, I don't know them personally, but you know the service works really well for us. No, they're not listed, unfortunately, but I, lo I love the buy what you know idea. That's a, that's a really cool question. That's fantastic. So Scott, uh, in a 2019 uh, episode of your podcast, the mm -hmm. Motley Fool podcast, um, you said, I think short selling is awful and I think it should be banned. <laughs> and, and look, that that pricked up my ears because, um, look, there's plenty of examples of where frauds have been caught by short sellers that yes. regulators have missed. Yes. Uh, Mimetics, Valiant over in the US, mm -hmm. Wirecard in Germany. Um, so two years later, yep. um, do you still hold that same view? And the internet doesn't forget, does it? <laughs> so here's the problem. Whenever, I, no, I don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I talk about short selling, I get flamed to buggery. You know what? I'm going to do it anyway because that's what I'm here for. And, and <laughs> luckily, luckily, I've got broad shoulders and I've been around a long time. Um, it, honestly, if you're it, annoying Bitcoin holders and short sellers, is the fastest way to get flamed on social media. For the record, you'll have to delete your Twitter. <laughs> oh mate, no, no chance. No, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll deal with it. Hey, so here's the thing. Um, what worries me about short selling? So there are some really smart, thoughtful, capable short sellers who are doing it their way, the right way, and I really have no problem with that action of short selling in itself, right? My issue with short selling is two things. The first is the activist short sellers. And there's plenty of examples. The Domino's short thesis from, I think, 2019, 2018, busted. Um, Wisetech busted. So there's, you know, this, we can highlight the successes and say, see, they're, they're necessary. You can look at the ones where they had these big activist 40-page, you know, color photos, emotive language. This is terrible. It doesn't actually come to pass. My biggest concern is not actually about short selling per se. It's the impact on the average shareholder. Right, so if you're a retail investor, we've, we've got plenty at Motley Fool, you guys have plenty in your community, who hear the short thesis and go, oh my God, I better sell. So the shares drop 20, 30%, largely in part because of the short thesis. Then all the people rush into the exits actually create the problem or, or exacerbate the problem. They go and sell in fear because we know fear drives faster than greed. They sell out in, in panic. The short thesis, maybe it's true, maybe it busts. If the short thesis busts, they've lost their money. They've, they've, they've sold it at a loss. They've literally bought high, sold low and they're scared out of the stock. Now, if you contrast that with a bull case, if I go on TV and say, I love company X, the shares probably don't move at all. Mm. Maybe they go up a fraction of 1%. It's such an asymmetric outcome that my issue isn't with short selling as a process per se. It's the fact that in the marketplace, the way it's being utilized, if you're an activist short seller and you have a nefarious intent, let's say, you can create a fantastic amount of profit just by the actions of prosecuting the short case, whether you're, not, whether you're right or not, that's the irony, right? So it's the reverse of a pump and dump. It's the dump and pump, or whatever you want to call it. There's probably a better phrase I can come up with. I'll have a that's think about it. That's not a bad term. Dump actually, and I don't pump. Mind that. Well, that's the thing, right? So it's, but that's the idea, right? So, so in that case, I honestly think so. The capital markets are there for the exchange of ownership interests, right? You want to see the shares? I want to buy mine. That's what it's for. You want to raise money? I've got some money to help you out run your business. That's what it's there for. When the capital markets look more like. I say, you know, it's it's a casino with people in nice suits, right? So is 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 trading naked options any different going to the TAB or punting on sports bet? I don't know that you can actually make that case, right? You're looking at something saying, I think this is a winner. I'm gonna punt on it. I'm gonna it's it's not you don't own the asset, you're not invested in the asset itself. So the, the more we get away from the exchange of ownership interests, I think the less served the average retail investor is. And frankly, I don't give a stuff about the guys in the glass towers in Sydney, right? What I care about is the average punter who's listening to us who's saying, I want to put some money aside regularly. I want to know it's a decent, fair, safe market that I can invest in with risks. There's absolutely risk in share investing. We know that. That's what the market should be. Right? That's what it's designed for. The rest of it, I think, is largely a corruption of people who've gone, 
I know how I can make some money. I'm going to create a product, structure a product. I'm going to t- talk the ASX into it because they get some money. The registrars get some cash. Great, everyone's happy here. Here's this great big self-reinforcing scheme. I won't call it anything else. Um, and, and so plenty of people make money, but who loses out? The poor knucklehead investor who thinks, I just got screwed then because I, I got scared out of the stock because someone produced a really, someone with an impressive name in a, in a glass office building produced a great report and said, here's what I should do. I said, that's my problem is, is the functioning of the market gets distorted by stuff like that. And I don't know that if we can remove market distortion, no, no one's going to ban short selling, right? So it's a, it's a moot, it's a moot client. Yeah, well, but our next question it, was going to be, your prime minister for a day, how would you do it? <laughs> yeah. oh, that's, that's easy. That, that's that's really easy. You, you can, I mean, think about the um, uh, the gun bans, right? John Howard's gun bans. You, you can absolutely say no one involved in the securities industries may short sell a stock. Now, does it stop you and I meeting behind the pub? And yeah, yeah, exactly. no, of course not. Yeah, yeah. But so, you know, you can't stop human behavior. There are still automatic <laughs> weapons in the community, so you can't yeah. stop it. Can you minimize the harm? Yeah, absolutely you could. And, and you know, honestly, if I was promised tomorrow, I would actually would do it. I, I literally would say, thanks, guys, it's been fun. That's not what the, what the stock market's about. Go on, go to the TAB. Go and set yourself up as a bookmaker. Knock yourself out. Well, there is an election next year. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you've got that marketing machine and the Motley Fool humming. There we so, go. <laughs> there, I like it. Three policies for 2022. <laughs> <laughs> Could this be the next? Exactly. I like it. I like it. I'm, I, I'm going with that. <laughs> you, you free to be campaign manager for a while? Because uh, I could. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. I'll see if Bryce will give me the time off. <laughs> we'll check out diaries after the show. <laughs> So, so, Scott, as we said at the start of the show, and we've already um, had plenty already, we've mm. got uh, a bunch of questions from our community, wide-ranging. Awesome. So, we'll, we thought we'd do a bit of a speed round. Okay. Um, so, let's start with one from Joseph. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on the GameStop and the rise of the meme stock? Yeah. I would put this in the market casino category. Um, I think they're... A lot of people have moved into investing recently, which is fantastic. Those who stick with it, who deliver long-term returns for themselves by putting money aside today for tomorrow, that's what investing is supposed to be about. And more people doing that, that's great. It's also brought a whole lot of people in who literally have a couple of extra bucks. They've got a stimulus check or job keeper or job seeker, or they've got some money left over because they didn't go overseas this year or last year. And they're, they're looking around and saying, what do I do with it? Right. And so when you get caught up in the idea, it's it's a perversion of investing, let's be really clear, right? So it's it's gambling, it's speculation, it's fun if you want to call it that. It's funny enough, I spent a hundred bucks at the TAB, someone called me a problem gambler. If I put a thousand dollars on GameStop, people say I'm investing or just having fun, or it's the, the whole context, the whole structure, the whole the quantum of money just changed. Once you say stock market, it somehow legitimizes everything, right? That's kind of the, the short case. So um I think it's bad, I think it's terrible, I'd stay well away from it. I think Maybe you make money, maybe you lose money, but you're playing a game you don't know the rules of, you don't know who's going to win, you don't know who's behind it. You are literally, you know, Warren Buffett's got a saying, if you're playing poker, you don't know who the patsy is at the table, you're the patsy. If you're playing the GameStop game, you're the patsy. You might Mm. still win, you might get lucky, but you're not doing it with any sense of investing as we know it, as we define the term. Mm. So the, that saga, GameStop, AMC, Cinemas, uh, BlackBerry, it's yep. really been uh, confined to the American investors mm-hmm. at the moment. Mm-hmm. And obviously Australians are participating, but we're not seeing the same thing on the ASX. Do you think it's just a matter of time or do you think there's structural things that are different here? Oh, good point. So there's there's one structural element. Well, there's two structural elements. The first is that we know that free trading in the US makes this stuff yeah. more likely, right? Hey, we're getting closer and closer to that though. And I'm like, I'm a big fan of paying less for investing, mm-hmm. but an ex-fool, Morgan Housel, um, wrote a really interesting piece a couple of years ago now saying when, when trades are 100 bucks mm-hmm. each, you had to think you really, think, really yeah. carefully about what you're doing, right? Yeah. When they're free, oh, I'll buy it now. Five minutes later, I'll change my sell. Who cares? There's no, there's no cost, right? And so the, the the psychological bias of having to commit to something is a really big deal. And I'm not sure, and people hate me saying this, I'm not sure cheaper brokerage is actually good for us. I think net-net, uh, save five bucks on brokerage, you invest $1,000 you might lose half of, do those maths. Yeah. You know, I'd rather pay 100 bucks in brokerage if it meant I was making better decisions that were actually better long-term. So that's... That's kind of that's the structural bit. The other structural bit, probably, thankfully, is that these are internet forums where most attention is being paid to most of the users who reside in the most populous Western country, which has the world's largest stock market. And so, you know, is a Reddit thread going to going to turn up around an Australian company? Maybe, but the eggs have got to get an Australian brokerage account, all that stuff that goes with it. So, creating the the momentum in Australia 
is just structurally harder, In thankfully, in this case. Um, normally, badly, right? We, we, we don't get access to capital markets and exchanges and currencies and stuff. In this case, it may well protect us from some of that to some degree. Could it happen? Absolutely. But there's those couple of structural impediments that hopefully keep us away from it. Mm. Uh, I'm just waiting for the Motley Fool meme stock fund. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we start seeing emails for failing Australian companies. AGL, yeah, this, yeah. is this the oh, stock? Man, man. <laughs> No, we're only Virgin. long-term investors. So the thing that I will say, the one thing we do do is we're not, we're not short-termers, we're not traders, we're not speculators. Um, our time horizons are at least three years. For my service, it's five years plus. Um, so we can stay well away from that. <laughs> I won't be doing that one, put, put it that way. Well, speaking of five years plus, we yes. have a question from Ash. And uh, it is, if you had to choose one mid-cap for the next five years oh. with great fundamentals, yep. which you've spoken about, and, yep. and of course, uh, management team, what would it be and why? Uh, and before you answer, with all okay. the appropriate disclaimers yes, around absolutely. not taking investing advice from a podcast <laughs> yep. and do your own research. Three reasons yes. why you should not buy this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting a theme from you, Blokes, can I say? If I, if I storm out here, it's not going to quite work. There's no visual, but uh, audio-wise, yeah, audio yeah, I'll, yeah, so. oh, I'll, 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 I'll do the footsteps on the way out. We, for the, we've never had a walkout, <laughs> so you could break new ground here. <laughs> I tempted only for the sheer humour of it, but I won't. Um... Oh man. Okay. So I, I so you're right. Personal uh, general advice only. I am licensed to give general advice, but it's only general advice, and consider how it suits your circumstances. Um, I so the one I own Kogan.com. Yep. I think Kogan is a really really great long term potential stock. Um, so full disclosure, I own the shares. Um, it's had a real bath recently mm. on the back of the COVID vaccine. The shares fell a third when the COVID vaccine was announced. It fell again a little bit, not far because it's already fallen a decent way um, on the recent inventory glut. Yeah. But if you think about a business with 3 million Australian customers that's signing up customers at a rate of knots, more people spending more money. I've got a, a heuristic, which is more people, um, so more customers spending more money more frequently. If you can get that triumvirate, well, you're not guaranteed to make money but you're in a decent position. I think Kogan, for me, is one of those businesses that has the potential to be much, much, much larger. They're going to eat up market share of online. Online's going to eat up market share of total retail. Kogan's there. They're not going to beat Amazon, by the way. This is not an Amazon killer. Yeah. They will probably be a number two to Amazon, maybe even a distant number two, but that's the market is going to be big enough, in my mind, for Kogan to do really, really well. So I own the shares, but that's the one I'd pick. They're another one that pump emails. They do. <laughs> <laughs> this really is a thing. <laughs> maybe we, Honestly, we I get so many from Kogan. <laughs> we should maybe create a ranker of companies by the email Email set. distribution, yeah. yeah. Emails per employee or something. There you go. <laughs> I wonder if that'd work. I'm trying to think of other examples. You'd probably get... You'd Probably you own something, I reckon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, if you want to hire us to be analysts, <laughs> <laughs> but you're, you're on my campaign staff, you yeah, might as well do something while well, between elections. <laughs> um, it's funny that you said Kogan because yep. some people uh, commented on that question in our discussion group mm -hmm. and said uh, they they thought you were going to pick Kogan. There you go. So they people obviously at least I'm consistent. Yeah. yeah. The, the other one that people thought you might pick mm -hmm. was A2 Milk. So oh, that's interesting. Uh, what are your thoughts? It's obviously struggled a little bit recently. Yes, yeah, so another stock I own. Uh, for full disclosure, and you mentioned that one, not me. So I, I, I'm not pumping <laughs> my stocks. Um, it's really struggling right now. Yeah. I I think so. I also own Blackmores, and I think my my view on that generally is China's really hurt these guys. And what people saw was Blackmores and A2 as China stocks, i.e. in China demand. What we've seen through COVID is the Daigu trade from Australia to China, the suitcase trade, the grey market trade. We never really knew what proportion of Australian retail sales were made up of those people, right? We knew how much was being literally sold in China or through distributors. We now know because there's, there's no Chinese tourists, no Chinese students in Australia, or very, very few. Um, so they're obviously Chinese residents, but a lot of that business has gone away. So we kind of, we're at a new base now. And I think the share prices largely reflect that new base, which means if there is any upside, those two businesses are likely to capture it as sales and profits recover. So I think Treasury Wine Estate is another one. Again, I own similar kind of circumstance. I think they're all they're all factoring in. Not, nothing gets better from here. And so I think to some degree, if it doesn't get any better, they're probably decent prices. They're probably not going to beat the market, but they're decent prices. If things do get better, there's decent upside potential, I think, from those three companies. So um, I like A2. I own, I'm not, it's not one of my favorite, favorite stocks. Um, other one I'd pick, by the way, is Domino's. I think Domino's is, is a really good company. I don't own that one. Um, doing a fantastic job of of just taking what should be a very simple, reasonably low down market, you know, base and cheese and a couple of meats on top and a bit of pineapple. Yeah. A couple they, of meats, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I just I said a couple. Um, they, uh, but they're literally, I mean, they, they've they've dropped prices. They've tech, they've just 
mash the tech right through this thing. Yeah. Their marketing is great. Their infill strategy of basically knowing that the more franchise locations you can have, the faster you get the pizza. The faster you get the pizza, the more you order. Mm. It's a really great virtual circle. And they're doing a great job here in New Zealand, Japan. They've, they've noble the Taiwan business. I wouldn't be surprised to see them expand in maybe the UK or Italy at some point. Um, it's just a, it's a really well, it's one of those cases of doing a really simple thing. Really, it's like retail. Retail is the easiest thing in the world, right? You buy some stock, you put it in a shop, job done. It's not hard, mm. but it's really hard to do well because the barriers to entry are really low. And if you can find a way to do that excellently, you really can do fantastically well. Mm. I remember early days of uni, like early 2010s, <laughs> Bryce and I were looking at Domino's <laughs> and uh, just blown away by it yeah. and saying exactly those same things, yeah. like how are they doing so well? Yeah. And they just keep going from strength to strength. Mate, I grew up with, I, I was a Pizza Hut fan as a kid. I, I We all ate Pizza Hut. Everyone, Domino's was this little yeah. a side brand that a few people liked, most people didn't eat. The story of that, when they tell that story of the last 25 years or so of Domino's growth, it is a really, really fascinating story. Mm-hmm. And it really is a story of when you get that, the kind of the flywheel spinning, the good to great flywheel, it makes a huge, huge difference. And you just eat away and eat away and eat away. Pun intended. All of a sudden, <laughs> there you go. You, you, you wake up one morning, you're like, wow, Domino's is, is it. Pizza Hut's barely hanging on. Yeah. Others have gone broke. Yeah. Eagle Boys. Um, Eagle, right. Yeah, exactly. never seen yeah. that. <laughs> even, even, even crust, right? Like it's, it's a premium pizza. But in this market, where Domino's makes it so easy, cheap, simple, it's in your face. Like, why wouldn't you? You kind of, it's the default choice. And when yeah. you're the default choice, the option is massive. Yeah. Mm. So um, another one from Clara, and uh, this is one that's, you know, becoming more and more important in our community. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on ethical investing? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna offend some people here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I wow. think I think we should. So on a personal level, climate change is real. We should take action against uh, climate change, sweatshops. The ESG approaches are fantastically important. I don't think as investors we have anywhere near as much impact as people like to think or as ethical investment companies want you to think. Now, speaking of my own book, I own Australian Ethical Investments. I own it because I think people will invest in their funds. I don't own it because I think it makes a difference. So that's a really important difference here. This is is the kind of cognitive dissonance, right, of... So here's the thing. If you own BHP shares and you don't like the fact that BHP is in mine, you sell them to me, you feel better, but I still own the shares, the company still exists, and you've had absolutely zero impact on the company. Maybe, maybe, maybe very tiny, slightly, you push the price down 0.0001% by adding to the selling pressure once, but once the sale's made, that goes away. So what impact do ethical investors really have? Honestly, unless you're activist in the boardroom, unless you're activist at shareholder meetings, actually making a difference, not just getting up and shouting, but literally changing policy, if BHP keep mining, if White Haven Coal keeps mining coal, you sell your shares because you don't like them, I buy them because I'm happy to buy them cheap, or vice versa, it changes nothing about the company at all. So I think ethical investing is, I won't call it greenwashing, but I think it's people wanting to feel good, wishing they could make a difference. I've said to people before, you can actually have more, more impact. Buying BHP, they do really well, take the share, take the profits and donate them to charity. You can do much better doing that than actually trying to pretend that by selling BHP and buying shares in a wind farm, you're making any difference whatsoever. Let me let me make the counter case, Ooh, yeah, uh, and I want to get your thoughts on yeah, it yeah, because yeah. for me, ethical. So I before uh, Bryce and I were doing this full time, I worked in a, the sustainability team at a, a major company. Nice. Well, we've talked about it on the show before. So Coles, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, good. And, and I saw firsthand the effect that ethical investing has not mm-hmm. on the movement of the stock price, but on the incentive structure within companies. Yeah. And BHP, Whitehaven Coal they're not really the companies that are going to be affected because yeah. it's their core business. Right, Exxon right. Mobil isn't going to pivot to a solar business. Right, right. But these edge cases, companies yep. that could do more but aren't incentivized to do more, mm-hmm. when money's flowing into ethical funds, mm-hmm. uh, there's pressure on the share price. Mm-hmm. CEOs, executives are incentivized by, based on share price mm-hmm. performance. They get their bonuses and all of that stuff. They keep their jobs. And uh, investors are... Uh, if, if investors are wanting to meet, uh, you know, the the sustainability team, if yeah. they want to hear about sustainability projects, if they're making buy decisions based on that, yeah. and that affects share price, mm-hmm. executives are then incentivized to care and to make decisions in that way. And in my three years at Coles, we saw it. Like we got, well, not me, but like my bosses got dragged into more meetings. Our CEO learned everything about our part of the business. <laughs> like they started to care more and more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, look, and that's great. I, I think that's... <sighs> I mean, look, you've been the inside. I'm not going to dispute your experience, right? What I would say is I think as consumers, we have infinitely more power 
per decision than as investors, right? Because to your point, you know what the best performing stock in the US was during the back half of the 20th century? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the tobacco company. Altria, right? Yeah, yeah. Philip Morris was the single best performing, not, not one of the best, not almost the best, not literally the single best company was Altria. Why? Everyone hated cigarettes. Everyone wanted to sell the share. So the share price created, stayed low. Guess what? They paid a fortune in dividends. Those dividends were invested, made it the top performing stock on the entire US market. Did they sell their cigarettes? No. Did ethical investors avoid it? Yes. Now, to your point, maybe they're always going to sell cigarettes, right? Maybe it is the edge cases, and maybe there is some tangential benefit there. Um, but again, who's buying or selling coals on the ethical ground specifically? Probably no one, right? Maybe they maybe they tick over from slightly okay to more okay or slightly not okay to slightly okay, and maybe that does change whether an ethical fund buys or doesn't buy. I, I would... And I, look, I take no joy in this, by the way. Like, I'm, I'm not being contrarian for the sake of it. I'm not, not talking it down. I want people to make really great consumer choices. Get out there, write letters to your MP. Go and shop with the businesses that do this stuff. Like, go and shop at Coles if they're being more sustainable than all this. Like, do it, please. I'm literally saying, please go and do it. As investors, I worry that we're all paying a truckload in fees to ethical funds who are happily saying, I won't name them either. Um, you know, plenty of Facebook ads. You know, you're, you're super invested in companies that are harming the environment. It's like, even if it's not. I don't not, think you need to name them. I yeah. think everyone knows who you're talking about. <laughs> even, if, even if it's not, right? Like, it makes no difference to that. They, they, BHP don't care. So, if your marketing strategy is buy our, buy, invest our funds, we're going to invest in BHP. It's like, you know what? You've done literally nothing for them. You've not helped BHP. You've not hurt BHP. You've done nothing other than put your money in their pocket, earn them fees. I'm not entirely sure anyone else benefits from it. So, I think. I don't hate ethical investing. I think it's much, 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 much less impactful than people want to believe because we all want to think we can make a difference, right? We want to believe. Um, to use the X-Files line for those people who are over a certain age, <laughs> you blokes wouldn't know, but trust me. Um, that, you know, that, that's the story. So I won't bang on about it. But I've, I've, I've written an article, if, if, if you don't mind me saying, yeah, yeah. Um, it's just titled The Inconvenient Truth of Ethical Investing. And it lays out the case. You can Google it. Um, that it, Again, I, I wish it was true. If it can be true, if you're right, then fantastic. I'd happily be, of all things I want to be wrong about, I'd love to be wrong about that. I just don't think it matters. Mm. Fair. Um, so moving on, one from Dave. And uh, speaking of companies that get the flywheel going, in my eyes, Fortescue is one of those. Yeah. Uh, but apparently, you're not quite a fan of the company. What's what's going on there? Yeah, so it's a mining issue. Um, mining companies struggle to actually have profitable business models over the long term. Um, if you're selling iron ore, I'm selling iron ore, you're selling iron ore, you're selling iron ore, BHP, Rio, Fortescue, they're all selling iron ore. It's all the same product, largely to quality differences and whatever, but stick with me. Over time, if you are selling at much more than the cost of production, someone else is going to be incentivized to start a mine. Over time, we know the price tends to correlate roughly with the cost of production. Um, it's just it's just the, the law of the land. Right? It's a commodity product. If I if I make something, you make something. We can, if there's only one buyer, they're going to buy mine. They're going to buy yours. We can say, well, I've got a nice brand and a nice corporate office. I don't care. Yeah. Uh, we got a nice CEO. I don't care. I'll take the lowest price, thanks very much. If you're in a price-taking industry rather than a price-making industry, it's tough. Right now, with the iron ore price through the roof, it's even tougher than normal. Like The chance that the iron ore price stays this high for a long period of time is so remote mm. that if you're investing in it right now, you're taking a massive, massive mm. risk in my yeah. view. I'd be happily walking away. Now, um, for uh, I for some reason in this interview, I've taken the role as devil's advocate, but, <laughs> but I, feel, I feel like I've got to because there's obviously a lot of Fortescue fans out yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. A and full disclosure, I don't own any mining companies for basically that, that reason. Cool. They're cyclical, they're commodity businesses. Yep. But in commodity businesses, don't you want to find the lowest cost producer because all everything you said is true, yes. but the lowest cost producer can win in that market because they can take the pain for longer as prices go down. Yes, and so this is where you want to separate the business from the stock, right? So is if Fortescue remains the lowest cost producer, is it the most likely to make the most money or the most money per tonne? Yes, absolutely. Is it most likely to survive? Yes, absolutely. Does that give you a market beating investment return? Potentially not. And that's the challenge, right? So you can have a great business. I bought shares in Coca-Cola Amateur, one of my big mistakes over the last seven or eight years. Um, bought shares, made a little bit of money, but lost to the market massively, right? I went, great brand, great distribution network. Everyone loves the product, well run, all this great stuff. You know what I missed? I missed the growth story. So what, you know, is anyone going to take Coke's business away? Not in a million years. Buffett and Munger famously, Rob, I think it was Munger, famously gave a speech saying, if you gave me $2 billion, I couldn't, this is in $970 or $980, I couldn't take Coke's market leadership away. I couldn't do it. It is a really fantastically wonderful business. But there's no growth left. It doesn't make it a great investment. And so that's the difference. So yes, you're absolutely right. Australian at Mines, and the Fortescue story is wonderful. Twiggy has done a spectacularly great job. We should be celebrating his business success. Does that mean you should invest at the current price in an iron ore miner? I don't think so. And those two things can be true at the same time. Yeah. 
So uh, there's no doubt that governments are spending big on infrastructure at yes, the moment. We've just had the New South Wales budget come through or, you know, talk of continued building. Lachlan mm-hmm. wants to know, what are your thoughts on infrastructure and construct- construction sector mm. and uh, particularly local prospects like Boral and Downer and Co.? So I have similar issues with those guys. I'm sorry to be... I, 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 I was going to say I like you. <laughs> well, we'll finish nice. this interview with... Would let's, you mind? Let's finish on a positive note. Like COVID again. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so here's the problem. These guys... So governments used to be really dumb, right? If you look at the old... The old trans, the first transurban toll roads, the governments were taking for a massive ride. Transurban went, oh, I'm going to get these guys really good. You watch this. Fast forward 10, 15 years, 20 years... Governments now realise the game they're playing and the governments are getting much, much smarter. So if you're in the infrastructure business even, or if you're doing it for a large uh, developer, they know exactly what they're doing. So they're going to say, I want it on time. I want it on budget or you're paying the penalty. And by the way, I'm going to put an open tender out to everybody and say, I'm going to take the best price. Yeah. So again, if that sounds like the iron industry, it probably should because that's exactly what it is. So again, is there going to be more infrastructure built? Absolutely. Do I think it's great for the taxpayer, for people? Absolutely. If everyone's doing open book costing and the lowest cost producer wins, it doesn't really matter how much volume is getting done until there's a supply constraint, which is there's more projects than people, mm. then they can start to name their price, right? So mining services back 10 years ago got to do exactly that. They said, everyone's opening new mines. There's only a half a dozen of us. We're going to set the price and you guys are going to pay it. Otherwise, your mine doesn't get built. That's great. When you flip it over and there's more mining services business than mine work, all of a sudden, they're all doing it for single-digit margins. And so construction infrastructure tends to be really low margin, and all the risk is yours. Governments don't say, oh, you had some problems with the weather. I'm sorry. That's fine. Yeah. Don't worry about paying the penalty. You don't have to do it on time. It's fine. They're like, no, no, no. You guys going to make a loss on this project so I can get what I want because I've got a class, uh, an ironclad contract. That's a tough business to be in. So I, I don't love infrastructure from a structural perspective. Yeah, nice. And then uh, before we get to our positive question, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, this is uh, this isn't particularly negative. Maybe you'll take it in a negative direction. <laughs> no, no. Um, I'll try not to. How about that? From Sean, yes. uh, where do you think commodity prices are going? <laughs> oh, come <laughs> on! <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> oh, I, I'll do more than one word. Down is the, is the <laughs> so I uh, know. Look, all different commodities are different, right? O- oil prices at the highest point since 2018. Right now, the iron ore price. So here's the thing, iron ore margins, I didn't say this before, iron ore margins are software margins. Fortescue's digs out, digs out the ground at less than 20 bucks a tonne. They're selling it for $200. Yeah. Microsoft would kill for those margins. Salesforce, Altium, um, Atlassian, Atlassian, these guys would kill for 90%, like 90% margins. It's crazy. So I don't know how you can see, like, and so I don't do predictions is the first thing. In the short term, I've got no idea because the market can be silly, disrupted. Oil was negative pricing last year. No one predicted that, right? So predictions are dumb. But if you asked me, do I think, what are the range of outcomes? There's a small possibility that over a couple of year time horizon, the price is higher. There's a very large probability it's lower. And of that, there's a decently large probability that it's much lower just because of the law of supply and demand. So you, you, give me something I can go with. But <laughs> look, I, you know, I, I just, I don't, I'm not happy about that. Like people, people often you know, I, I get painters this guy who's like negative about mining. Like, I don't want to be negative about mining. Like I'm glad they're there. I'm glad they're doing the thing, environmental impacts aside. Um, you know, they're doing what they can. But I think... If the, if the business, when you want to buy a miner, if you want to, is when the cost, when the, when the price of the commodity is close to the marginal cost of production. And that's a jargony term. Effectively, if it costs you 20 bucks a ton to get iron out of the ground, selling for $20, $25 a ton, selling for the price, then you want to buy. Because the downside is relatively limited. Mm. The upside is huge. We've got exactly the opposite scenario right now where there's so much margin already in the price. It's hard to imagine a scenario where they make even more money mm. and meaningfully more money. If it's a little bit more, if it's the same, you're going to get roughly marginal returns. If it's less, you lose money. If it's a bit more, you make a bit of money. That's a really tough set mm. of set of outcomes. Mm. And just as the world opens back up, and you know, like more steel mills open yeah. up and stuff, like the the everything's going to even out a little bit. Mm. Like I saw a chart with the price of lumber a couple of days yeah, ago. It's crazy. And obviously, mm. it rocketed up, and mm-hmm. that, a lot of that was because a lot of the processing facilities shut down during COVID. Right. But uh, this chart, the the prices fallen right back down again as as these things it's, open up. And, that, and that's the benefit of being old and not having much hair, right? Is the, is the, <laughs> uh, you, I've seen this cycle so many times. And at the time, there's always, you know, maybe the, the mining super cycle of 2011 was supposed to be the, 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 the permanent thing, right? Now let's talk of another mining. When people start to say, oh, maybe it's a super cycle, that's your signal to sell. Because we've been here that many times. The longer you hear, the more cycles you go through, you're more like, oh, I've seen this movie before. I know how this one ends. Right now, people don't want to think about it or haven't had the experience. It's like recessions, right? People before COVID, if you are under 40, you've never worked through a recession in your life. It's hard to imagine what it might look like. Mm. Now we know um, it takes that experience to, to work through. Mm. Mm. 
So we will, before we jump into our final three, Scott, we will finish on a positive. <laughs> Not <laughs> to say it's all been negative, no, no, though. No. It's, it's been, uh, we do appreciate you answering Thank you. all these questions from our community. Pleasure. Um, what's one thing that's really getting you excited about markets today? So I'm going to give a boring answer, but hopefully a positive answer, which is that um, more people are investing in shares than ever before. More young people are investing in shares than ever before. Now, unfortunately, partly that's because they've kind of checked out of the housing market, which sucks. So that's a whole different, we won't get down that tangent. Um, but a lot of people are investing. The power of investing shows no sign of abating. And the sheer power of compounding, honestly, like I, I read, read an email the other day about, I feel like Sisyphus, you know, rolling the, rolling the stone up the hill and then come back the next day and it's back down at the bottom. Trying to convince people that this is actually worth doing is like this, this never ending effort because the new people and people have different experiences. I'm just, uh, this is a, it's, a, it's a boring answer. It's probably a, a bit of a, you know, a copy book answer, but it's literally like the, the power of compounding doesn't stop. Markets come and go, trends come and go, the hot topics come and go. But if you look at the history, go to the, you guys are talking about this, check out the Vanguard index chart. Google mm. Vanguard index chart 2020. Go and grab it right now. Pause the podcast. Sorry, guys. Um, <laughs> Google Vanguard index chart 2020. Go and, the, the, the sheer compound value of investing is just continues to blow my mind and I'm desperate for more and more people to get involved in it even if they don't buy any of our services even if they just buy an ETF and forget about it I don't I genuinely don't care my boss doesn't want me to say that oh he doesn't care but um, <laughs> like I don't care don't buy don't buy monthly full service go and buy an ETF add to it every month and retire stupidly rich like quite literally no guarantees no promises because I'm not allowed to I don't know of anything more likely than that if you're 25 now you've got 42 years till retirement you guys have done the compound math on that that is just stupidly large mm. If you're listening and you haven't got started, please, for the love of God, just start investing now. Like right now, buy an ETF right now. Get on with it. Um, it, it and keep adding to it. It's, it's just, it's stupidly simple. We we make it way too complex. Finance, the finance industry thrives on making things yeah. complex and opaque because that's how we make our money, right? And we say, we don't necessarily mean me or you guys, but the industry, the stupid fees that people get charged for not knowing any better is is unconscionable. But just to keep it simple, invest in an ETF. And then if you want to buy stocks, go for it. If you want to do something else, go for it. But at least get started. Yeah, mm. nice. That's a good note to end it on. And it is something that I appreciate uh, about about you, Scott. Whenever you know we hear your podcast or we see you on the news, you do... You know, you do embody that breaking it down, making it simple, and I'm a simple man. trying to help people understand <laughs> it. So, Motley Fool ads and emails aside, we uh, we do appreciate what you're doing. Thank you, appreciate it. Um, before we get into these final three questions, yep. if people want to follow you online mm -hmm. or uh, you know listen to your podcast or anything like that, where should they go? You're Wherever. very kind. So, um, social media uh, TMF Scott P TMF Scott P the TMF the Motley Fool uh, Twitter and Instagram um, Scott Phillips Money on Facebook the Motley Fools accounts are there as well. Um, we've got a website you guys can look up. I'm not going to give it a plug. Uh, Motley Fool Money is the name of the podcast. So you can check that out. Let's do it. It's investing first, of course. But after that, hey, check out the uh, check we, out, we, check out we Motley Fool Money. That we all grow the pie in podcasting. As soon as someone <laughs> Honestly, turns yeah. that radio off and starts listening to podcasts, it's more likely <laughs> they ahead. listen to a second and a third and a fourth. I've always said, you know, there are, there are enough bad guys in, in finance that if we can find some like minds, whether you love our marketing or not, it's a different question. <laughs> if we find some like minds in investing, you know, if there's, if there's a half a dozen of us that are trying to push the right stories, they'll, people will get the right threads from enough of them mm. and start mm. to put those things together. So as you say, the more, the more the merrier, quite yeah. honestly. Yeah. Now, Scott, we'll jump into these uh, Let's do it. three final questions. The first one is, uh, do you have any books that you consider must-reads? Um, so really boringly, The Essays of Warren Buffett by Lawrence Cunningham is a fantastic read. Um, Buffett is a guru, is a genius for all the right reasons. Um, this book actually puts it in topic sections rather than chronological order, which makes it so much easier to read. Because Buffett's letters, they're great, but if you start in 1965 and work your way through, it kind of weaves in and out of different topics. This mm. literally puts all the topics that might be, I don't know, competitive advantage, puts them all together, and you read all of his writings about that. It's really, really useful. Good to Great is my favorite business book of all time. It's not an investing book at all. Um, but if you want to think about what makes a business better than another, and I talked about fundamentals at the beginning, so we bookended it nicely. Jim Collins is a great guy, scientifically based, not just... Can I say success porn? Am I allowed to say that on the podcast? Go for it, yeah. <laughs> so most business books are success porn, right? Here's what I did. You can do it too. You know what? You're not Richard Branson. Neither am I. Richard Branson's Richard Branson. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And I love his books. Like They're really fun reads. Mm. I'm not going to start a music shop and become you know, the, the next CEO of Virgin. I'm not going to become the next anybody, right? Neither are you, neither are our <laughs> listeners. So it's, also, it's all like, I wish I could do that. And so we get excited about it because we think, oh, maybe I could be that too. Good to Great is academically based, it's scientifically based. They've done the research. It's a, it's a really, really great book, so I'd recommend that. And then I'd recommend One Up on Wall Street by Peter Lynch. Yeah. Yeah. Really good book. Yeah, Nice one. Three good recommendations there. Uh, next one, in 60 seconds or less, 
What's the best company you've ever come across? I've always wanted to be on Sale of the Century. <laughs> <laughs> Time starts now. Yeah. Your listeners aren't going to know Sale of the Century. What am I doing? Uh, I know, I know. <laughs> Whatever the new X-Files version of that is. Sales of I the know, century. mate. Some dated references. Dated myself here. beautifully, haven't I? <laughs> Let me tell you about horses and carts. <laughs> I've taken up 15 seconds already. Um, True. <laughs> it's a worry, isn't it? 20. Uh, best company. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway, by a long shot okay. for all the reasons you'd expect. Um, but I'll go to Amazon.com. Um, Google Amazon 1997 shareholder letter. Jeff Bezos effectively predicts the future by inventing it. He says, this is who we are. This is what we're going to do. And the whole, this is day one. Mm. It's always day one. Mm. If you're looking for a company that is set out to be built for the long term, I don't know of a better example than Amazon. I own shares for full disclosure. Um, Unfortunately, I didn't buy them back then. A really, just a, you look at it and go, man, this guy did that and they're still doing it today. Great business. Great yeah. business. Yeah, unbelievable business. Berkshire, also an unbelievable business. Not bad, is it? I yeah. shares in that too. I should, again, for full disclosure. And then final question, if you think back to your younger self, you know, in the high-flying tech <laughs> boom hair, of yep. the uh, late 90s, <laughs> um, what advice would you give to your younger self? Um, start. Yeah. I, I, I went to high school... My economics and maths teachers both talked about compound interest and I got it. I got it. Like I, I'm the world's biggest idiot, right? I got it at 15, 16, 40. I got it. And then I just stuffed around for a decade. And if you, I won't, I probably will try and even go back and do those maths, right? If I could put an extra decade on my investing compound returns at the other end, there's probably a seven figure difference in that, mm-hmm. quite honestly. Mm-hmm. I cost myself probably a million dollars in retirement by not starting at 18, but waiting till I was 25, 26. That, that cost is phenomenal. So Start um, and just stay the course. Volatility will happen. It just does. It's not a feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. Not a feature of bug, whichever way you're going. Um, the, the idea of, you know, just 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 start and and keep going. Add regularly. To just do it. Like, it's not that hard. Start. Yeah. Love it, Scott. We'll very much appreciate you coming on the show. We covered a lot of ground. I uh, appreciate your honesty. And uh, Pleasure, thank, thank you. you for also answering all the questions from our community. Um, those were just a select few from the near hundreds that we got. Oh, we so. appreciate it. Thank you. It's great. great. Um, very much appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to catching up and having back on at some point. I look forward to all the emails in your inbox when you finish. <laughs> check, check your emails. Click on the, click on the link. <laughs> Thanks, guys. It's been fun. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful.